In the vast expanse of human history, few things hold as much weight as the names we ascribe to that which we revere. Names carry power, they represent identity, evoke emotions and connect us to something larger than ourselves. Yet, when it comes to the name of the Creator, the one worshipped by billions across millennia, a peculiar mystery emerges. A name whispered by ancient prophets and etched into sacred scrolls seems to have faded from common knowledge, the name Yahweh. Mentioned nearly 7,000 times in the original Hebrew Bible, Yahweh stands as a testament to a time when humanity spoke directly to the divine. It wasn't a distant, unknowable entity, but a being with a name, a name that held the power of creation itself. So how did this name, so central to the faith of billions, become shrouded in mystery? Why do we rarely encounter it in our modern world? To understand the significance of a name like Yahuwah, we must first understand the power names hold in our own lives. Our names are more than just labels. They are intricately woven into the fabric of our being, shaping our sense of self and influencing how others perceive us. Imagine then the profound significance of the Creator's name. It is a direct link to the Divine, a way to connect with the source of all creation on a personal level. Knowing and speaking this name was not just an act of reverence, but a way to tap into the very essence of the Divine. It was a privilege a responsibility and a source of immense spiritual power. The journey of Yahweh's name from ancient scrolls to modern day scripture is a complex one marked by cultural shifts, linguistic evolution and theological interpretations. As the Hebrew Bible, written in its original Hebrew, began its journey across cultures and languages, it encountered a fundamental challenge. Translation. Translating a text goes beyond simply swapping words. It involves bridging cultural context, understanding nuances, and conveying the essence of the original message. In the case of Yahweh, the challenges were amplified by the sacredness associated with the name. The Hebrew language, unlike English, doesn't use vowels in its written form. The tetragrammaton, the four Hebrew letters representing Yahweh, Yevh, was often left unvocalized out of reverence, leaving the exact pronunciation to be passed down orally through generations. Section 4, Lost in Transliteration, the alphabet's role. Adding another layer of complexity to this linguistic puzzle was the process of transliteration. Transliteration involves representing the letters of one alphabet using the letters of another. As the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, the dominant language of scholarship at the time, the Tetragrammaton, posed a significant challenge. Greek lacked a direct equivalent for the Hebrew sound represented by Y, leading to various interpretations and substitutions. The most common substitution was the Greek word Kyrios, meaning Lord. While this conveyed a sense of respect and authority, it inevitably moved the text further away from the original name and its inherent power. Centuries later, as the Bible continued its journey into Latin and eventually English, the name Yahweh became increasingly obscured, replaced by titles like Lord and God. Section 5. Accidental or Intentional, Unraveling the Mystery. The disappearance of Yahweh's name from common usage raises a question that has intrigued scholars and theologians for centuries. Was this a gradual, unintentional consequence of linguistic evolution and cultural shifts? Or was there a deliberate effort to suppress the name? Some argue that the substitution of titles for the divine name was driven by a desire to avoid blasphemy. The sacredness associated with the name led some to believe that it was too holy to be uttered by human lips. Others posit that the shift away from Yahuwah was a way to facilitate the integration of other cultures and belief systems, making the text more accessible to a wider audience. Whatever the reason, the impact is undeniable. The name that once reverberated through ancient temples and echoed in the hearts of believers now remains largely unknown, a whisper lost in the corridors of time. Section 6, Reclaiming the Name, A Journey of Understanding. As we delve into the mystery of Yahuwah's name, it's important to remember that this is not just an exercise in linguistic archaeology. It's about reconnecting with the roots of faith, understanding the evolution of religious thought, and appreciating the complexities of cultural transmission across millennia. 
Reclaiming this name is not about imposing a single definitive interpretation. It's about fostering a deeper understanding of the rich tapestry of faith, recognizing the power inherent in names and acknowledging the profound impact that translation and transliteration have had on our understanding of the divine. It's a journey of discovery, inviting us to explore the past, engage with the present, and approach the divine with a renewed sense of awe and wonder. Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media. This is Yeshayahu, where we address the problems of a modern world. Christians pray to God and Muslims to Allah. But my question is, who did Moses pray to? We're going to find out why Yahuwah's name disappeared. And my friends, it was no accident. Today's topics, a name erased beyond geography, a people displaced. Yahuwah in exile, whispered in reverence, reclaiming the divine name. Welcome to our channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And most of all, enjoy the show. Pay attention, you might learn something. Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 7. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am Yahweh, the Kodesh of Yasharel. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, you have stubbornly refused to heed my words. Jeremiah chapter 44 verse 26. The prophet Jeremiah delivers a stark message to the remnant of Judah. Their sinfulness and refusal to heed God's warnings have led to devastating consequences. Among these is a profound spiritual loss, the fading away of Yahweh's name from their lips and their hearts. This prophecy, uttered amidst the ruins of Jerusalem, echoes through time, carrying profound implications for our understanding of faith and divine presence. To comprehend the gravity of Jeremiah's prophecy, we must delve into the symbolic language of the Bible. Egypt, more than a geographical location, represents a state of spiritual enslavement. It signifies a return to old ways, a rejection of Yahweh's covenant, and an embrace of idolatry. Similarly, Babel, with its tower reaching for the heavens, embodies the human desire to usurp divine authority. It signifies confusion, the fracturing of communication with the divine, and the elevation of human ambition over divine will. The historical context of Jeremiah's prophecy is the Babylonian captivity, a period of profound upheaval and trauma for the Hebrew people. The destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple, the center of their religious and communal life, forced them into exile in a foreign land. In this alien environment, surrounded by unfamiliar gods and practices, their faith was tested like never before. The Babylonian exile was not merely a physical displacement, but a spiritual crisis. Removed from their homeland and their sacred spaces, the Israelites faced the potential loss of their identity, their traditions, and their very connection to Yahweh. Section 4, Fading Whisper, Yahweh in Exile. It was during this time of vulnerability and uncertainty that the prophecy of the fading name began to unfold. Surrounded by the clamor of Babylonian deities and rituals, the Israelites gradually incorporated elements of Babylonian religion into their own. The distinct identity of Yahweh, the one true God who had liberated them from Egypt and covenanted with them at Sinai, became blurred. Fearful of further persecution and eager to assimilate, some Israelites avoided using the name Yahweh, replacing it with more generic titles like Adonai, Lord, or Elohim, God. This shift in language reflected a deeper shift in their hearts, a distancing from the personal, intimate relationship they once had with their God. Section 5. The name today whispered in reverence. The ramifications of this historical event reverberate even today. The avoidance of the name Yahweh, which began as a reaction to the trauma of exile, has persisted throughout centuries, 
evolving into a complex tapestry of religious and cultural sensitivities. Some faith traditions continue to refrain from uttering the divine name out of reverence, considering it too sacred for human lips. Others have replaced it with titles like Lord or God, perpetuating the distance that began in the Babylonian exile. While the reasons for this avoidance are rooted in deep respect and a desire to honor the divine, it has inadvertently contributed to a sense of disconnect between humanity and the divine. Section 6. Reclaiming the Divine Name The fading of Yahweh's name serves as a potent reminder of the fragility of faith and the importance of preserving our connection to the divine. It challenges us to confront the ways in which we might be contributing to the spiritual exile of our own time. While the avoidance of the name Yahuwah stems from a place of reverence, perhaps the true act of reverence lies in rediscovering its power. Speaking the divine name with understanding and respect can be a way of reclaiming our spiritual heritage, restoring the intimacy of our relationship with the divine and bridging the chasm that has separated humanity from the divine for far too long. The creator of heaven and earth told you his name nearly 7,000 times in the Bible. So the question is, why does almost no one know his name? That should set off uh, little alarm bells, because that cannot be an accident. The Bible is, has been the best-selling book in the world for the last, uh, I don't know, 1,000 years. Um. It's not like there aren't experts in the Hebrew language amongst us. What What is going on? It's it's almost like, all right, here we go. Here's that word again. Conspiracy. <laughs> how, can some, how can the creator of heaven and earth tell you his name 7,000 times? And you ask your average, just pass somebody in the street, well, what's the name of the creator of heaven and earth? In this country, in America, you'll probably get, oh, his name is God. Well, that's, are you reading from the scriptures or are you just regurgitating what you've been taught all your life? That's not what the scriptures say. They, they give a name. And it's not like it's some weird outlandish thing that you can't pronounce that's that's the next thing oh you can't pronounce it uh, it's a tetragrammaton it's you know it's, there are no vowels in it well duh it's hebrew it's not supposed to have vowels in it <laughs> so so you mean to tell me it's impossible to speak hebrew because there's no vowels and uh, they speak it every day yeah so yeah people know what the name is they the people who know best what the name is, is not telling you, you know, they're not even saying the name. So you can say, well, because the name is revered and you probably shouldn't, you want to make sure you don't use it in vain. So, hey, let's just not say it. Um, King David said otherwise. He said, I, I will praise your name in the great congregation, I will praise your name to the nations, right? Uh, what, what's different? What's, what changed? Well, in the previous video, you saw where a lot of things changed after the Babylonian captivity. Being in Babylon changed a lot of things. And I won't go into it in this video, but a lot of things changed in Babylon. So why does almost no one know his name? The Bible is derived from inspired Hebrew writings in their original language, writings and form. What, what, have, what have now, what we have now are various translations and transliterations into other languages and translations of translations. Was the name of the Most High accidentally lost or more insidiously, purposely dropped? something to think about people are so easily deceived people are taught from a young age that the magi came to visit the baby jesus lying in a manger on christmas morning how convoluted is that 
in actuality, Christ was at least two years old and living in a house by the time the Magi came to see him. That's why King Herod gave the command to kill all male children two years old and younger in Bethlehem. People believe in, their, uh, believe in the infant manger scene because that is what they've been taught. And the people who taught them were just regurgitating what, what they were taught. Most people don't even sit down and read the Bible to see if the things they are being taught are even true. They just accept it at face value. You know, because you sit in a pew every Sunday or even Saturday, right? And your preacher is telling you, and you trust that preacher, right? Just like other false teachings, we have been deceived concerning the name of the Most High, Yahweh, and his son, Yahweh Shah. And that is very important. We call the Most High God and think, we, we call the Most High God and think this is his name. Well, God is actually a title. And his name is not God. That's an old Teutonic or Germanic term. And it doesn't even originate with the Germans, but they kind of made it popular. Um, but that's just a title. And in, in their language, it kind of means um, the, like the higher power or the high one, you know. Uh, ultimately, it comes from um, a word that's from ancient Phoenician. Um, it's only spelled with two letters. Um, and it's pronounced God, but it means, it can mean a troop. Uh, so there's a tribe in, of Israelites named the tribe of God. Most people pronounce it Gad, but it's actually pronounced God. But where does that term come from? That term also can mean a young goat. Oh, wait a minute, goat. Hmm. Well, let's see, let's read some more. We call the Messiah Jesus and think that's his name. All this comes about because we accept the word of men who are just passing along what they were taught. We as believers must be immersed and repent from breaking the commandments or start, uh, or start calling on the name of Yahusha, the Messiah. When we say Yahusha HaMashiach. The Messiah doesn't have two names. He has one Hebrew name, the inspired name. Yahusha. Not the name of some translator that some translator gave you, but his true name. The powers that be took his real name out of the scriptures and put in a false placeholder. The name of the Messiah, Christ, or Christ, literally means Yahweh is our deliverer. Now, if you look at the two names, go back to the second line. Yahuwah and his son, Yahusha. Well, actually, the long form of the, the son's name is actually Yahuwah Sha, which means Yahuwah, our deliverer, right? So technically, the father and the son have the same name, and that's not by accident. Now you have to ask the question, what does Yahuwah mean? So when Moses was on Mount Sinai and he turned and he asked, he said, surely the people are going to ask me, what is the name of our Alaim? And he said, I am that I am. That's the English, King James English translation. But what he said was, Ahaya, Ashir, Ahaya, I will be what I will be, or I am that I am. So Moses goes down the mountain and they ask, Ask Moses, what is the name of our Alayim? And he says, he is. He says, Yahweh. What that's denoting is his eternal nature. So I like to, if I'm going to put it in English, I, I, I tend to use the word eternal, the eternal one. Because when you say Yahweh Elohim, what you're actually saying is the eternal mighty one. And so that the delineate, that separates him from all other Alaim, and Alaim just means mighty ones, right? Plural, mighty ones, or Allah, which means 
mighty one, right? Or a high one. So, you know, you could be, and, and that's the weird part is that in Islam, they say Allah. Well, that's a Hebrew word, and it means high one. And so we, we look, you know, in the West, they look down on people who pray to Allah. Well, everybody in the Bible prayed to Allah. And when, in the plural form, they pray to Allahim. Allahim. And, and sometimes they try to translate it as Elohim, but the first letter is Aleph, which is the equivalent to the letter A. So it's not so much Elohim as it is Allahim, right? The mighty ones. And who are the mighty ones? Why plural? Well, Yahweh and Yahweh Shah. The two are one. But uh, that's not really the, I'm not going to dig, too deep into that in this video we've talked about that ad nauseum in other videos it is written in the bible that yahuwah actually removes his name from the lips not the text because of the sinfulness of the people therefore hear ye the word of, of yahuwah all yahuda that dwell in the land of mitzvahim egypt behold i have sworn by my great name because he can't swear by anything greater. Seth Yahweh, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Yahuda in all the land of Mitzrayim, saying, Yahweh Elohim, Elohim liveth. Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 26. Remember the term Egypt, Mitzrayim, literally means captivity. So this is a metaphor at, at this time. The conquered people of Yehuda were being taken into Babylonian captivity. Keep in mind, Babel means confusion. Another metaphor for the state of his people. While in Babylon, the verbal use of the name Yahuwah was slowly diminished. The effects were so profound that even today, even today, I mean, that's, Thousands of years later, the name is virtually unknown and unused. So peep this. Christians lift up the name of God and Jesus. Islam lifts up the name of Allah, right? Well, who's lifting up the name Yahweh? Only his people will lift that name up. And, and we'll see. You will see more of this, right? This was just prophecy being fulfilled. Today, people seem to have no interest in speaking his name. They avoid it like the plague, denounce it, replace it, and even abhor it. And anyone who might dare make mention of it, it's as if it were offensive to people. Now, and I, I've seen that. At worst, you should say, oh, that's nice to know. So his real name is Yahweh? Oh, great. I'll file that in my memory. But no, people get offended, and it's amazing. That, that's just Satan at work. There is still a remnant today that speaks his true name and love his name and his commandments. It is like a seal or a stamp in the foreheads of his people. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people, Yasharel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am Yahweh. The Kodesh one of Yasharel, Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 7. Then hear thou from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all people of the earth, all people of the earth, may know thy name. So it's not some secret. The intent is for all people on this planet to know your name, to know his name, and to fear thee. As doth thy people, Yasharel, and may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name, Second Chronicles chapter six and verse thirty three. Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I, Yahweh, right? Isaiah chapter fifty two and verse six. So it's not supposed to be some secret. Where does that come from? 
Well, it comes right out of Babylon. Immediately after Babylon, Babylon, they start coming up with these things. The name of the Most High, Yahuwah, and the Messiah, Yahusha, have been replaced by pagan terms such as God, which is Germanic for Odin. I can go through that again, but I won't. Lord, which is Baal or Bel, and Jesus. The name Jesus is only a few hundred years old since the letter J wasn't even invented till around the year 1550 CE, right? Or AD, as I still like to say. And it probably wasn't in wide use until about 1650 because in the King James original issue, it was a 1611 issue, the letter J is nowhere in it because it wasn't in wide use at that time. So just something to think about, you know. Why not take a chance, huh? Why not use his actual name? Moses did it, right? David did it. Solomon did it. And you should do it too. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 6, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. I love that. Can't you, can't you see it? Well, I'm going to end it on that note. And I uh, just want to thank you all. I love you all so much. And thank you for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, hit the thumbs up button. Subscribe and turn on the notification bell. And share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they find it interesting as well. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. And thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated on certain events around the world. And there's a lot happening around the world. So keep, keep it up. Keep sending me stuff. I very much appreciate you all. And shout out to the channel members. And may everybody have a beautiful and blessed day. Those in the body. Of Messiah, Yahusha, Hamashiach, and I'll see you on the next video. Shalom.